Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India All right. The mercantilists came under considerable fire by economists from the middle of 18th century onwards. In a sense, this was because the whole focus of European economy had changed dramatically by 1750s. Partly also, this was because the focus of the European intellectual focus of European thinker also had changed dramatically by this time. Most importantly, by 1750s, Europe was not dominated by merchants anymore. Europe was dominated by merchants who had turned into manufacturers. So, from 1750s onwards, it is the manufacturer, the process of industrialization, these things took the focus of people's attention. With one thing or another, yes, the whole political character of European governments had changed. So, the world in Europe was very different from 1750s and afterwards as it was and in compared to what it was in 1550s and afterwards. As a result, there was considerable harsh and healthy critique. The man called Home, contemporary of Adam Smith and a good friend of Adam Smith, who fired a major salvo against mercantilists. What Holmes said was, using the specie flow argument, you bring in more money into the country, the M in MV increases, which means supply of money increases. Initially, the prices do not respond and transactions take even more time to respond. You hike the price, it follows in the minds of most people that supply of goods would increase, but there is a big lag between the time when supply of goods can be increased and the time when money comes in. That is when all the new money gets converted into manufactured goods and that takes time. So, what happens immediately which is what home perceived is that instead of in, in P Q um, in P Q or P Y or P T whatever you have that before the number of transactions increased dramatically, it is price which is going to increase dramatically because money supply increased. No? So, Holmes said, if money supply increases the prices, then domestic prices all around increase. Then if you are exporting x percent of this domestic output, then it simply follows that your exports are going to be costlier. So, you lose the advantage of being a great exporter, if, a, if you find that your exports are costlier, they are losing their competitive advantage and you are back to square number one, no more trade surplus. So, the whole process according to home was self-defeating. On the one hand, you create a trade surplus through conscious policy, it brings in money. And as soon as the money comes in, prices start shooting up and therefore, your exports which were hitherto competitive are no longer competitive, they have lost the competitive edge. As a result, the whole advantage which you had through trade surplus has vanished back to square number 1. So, Holmes says this whole thing is a big illusion that money supply can increase a nation's welfare says no, it can lead to a short term spurt in output, I um, in market supplies. Businessmen can supply you something out of stock 
which they have in the warehouse they can release it and give it to you because money supply has come. But in the long run what is going to happen is that you will be back to square number 1 lose all advantage. So, that you will have major benefits in the economy out of trade surplus and then the bullions coming in. In other words in one shot he was trying to demolish the entire mercantilist argument. He said this is purely illusory there is no gain to be made out of this strong argument. How did the mercantilists counter this? It is true that the students of Home, the students of Adam Smith and all those who followed them later thought that Home had virtually destroyed the mercantilist argument, but the mercantilists persisted. They used the arguments of Cantillon who was an Irishman who lived in Paris and London, a banker. What Cantillon said was had said long before this Holmes argument had come, he had anticipated this price increase thing. So, he said sure, when money comes in the most natural thing would, would, would be for the prices to go up. So, he says okay, but if prices go up it is good because our export earnings will rise. So, it is good for us our trade surplus will grow. So, what is the problem? That was Cantillon's argument. So, the question is whether you accepted Holmes argument that price increase is harmful and you lose competitive advantage or you accepted Cantillon's argument that price increase actually fetches more export earnings and therefore, it improves your trade surplus even more. The question is which of these arguments you accept and there is a little catch. If you know something about elasticities price elasticities, you can answer the question about who is going to be right, who is going to be wrong. What has price elasticities got to do with this? Tell me. Uh, I think you can say it a lot more clearly, more lucidly. Of course, you know. No, uh, if the demand for a particular good is more is is uh, quite like, more elastic, uh, the, if there's an increase uh, in its price, then you people will actually substitute and people will actually switch to another right, good. Right, right, right. So, what does it tell you about the debate between these two guys? That the mercantilist using Cantillon's argument and the others using Holmes' argument. Yep. Yes, yes. If the demand for the exports is inelastic, so in spite of an increase in prices, the amount of exports would not change much, so which means you will generate more surplus. But if the demand for exports was elastic, then as your price increases, your uh, exports will fall. Absolutely, absolutely. My God, I must once again remark upon the quality of your lunch. <laughs> but surely, I mean, it can't happen again and again. So there must have been something in that, you know. Hmm? Popeye's spinach, spinach. He opens a little box, swallows it, and he smashes up the enemy. Don't smash me up, but keep up the good, done, good lunch and so forth. Great, lovely. So you got it absolutely right. The whole thing depends upon what assumptions you make you make about the elasticities, elasticities of demand for exports and imports, price elasticities. If you assume that demand is elastic, then home is right. If you assume demand is inelastic, then Cantillon is right. So, eventually since elasticity itself was something which they could not measure in those days the debate ended as a supposition versus another supposition. So much for Holmes criticism, but Holmes criticism became immensely popular not because as I said people knew something about elasticities, 
but Holmes criticism became very popular because there were other reasons why the mercantilist case was dismantled. You know, when a citadel, when the citadel of your enemy is falling, then a little mouse can go through and gnaw a little piece of wood somewhere and the whole thing falls to pieces. In the same way, the citadel of the mercantilist was brought down by other arguments which we shall see shortly and therefore, they had no case. But as I said, this argument of home on specie flow or quantity theory and the reply which mercantilist produced from Cantillon's argument, which is right eventually, which has greater weight is something which depends upon what one assumes about price elasticities of demand for exports and imports. No? Okay, so, the answer is conditional on that, but a bigger criticism came as I said the citadel of the mercantilists was broken by other reasons. For instance, physiocrats, who are the physiocrats, do you know something about them? Are they something, something like autocrats? No, why are they called physiocrats? Have you heard of them ever? You will hear of them next week anyway, so we will get to them. Physiocrats were a group of economists who were popular in France between 1750s and 1770s, across Europe actually for what they said. We will look at the physiocratic argument in detail next week, but for the time being it is enough for us to know that the physiocrats said, who told you that trading surplus is the basis of a nation's prosperity? They asked this question. Because as you know, the mercantilists were all the time trying to emphasize the trading surplus part, right? which is why the political economy of the mercantilists was big. So, they said, who told you that say, trading surplus is something which can build a nation, bring wealth into the nation? So, people asked physiocrats, okay, then what else can? Physiocrats said, where is everything happening in, happening in an economy? During those days, France and most of Europe was still largely agricultural. So, they said of course, in the fields, in the farms, that is where everything happens. So, where is the surplus coming from which will build the nation? From the farms, from the hands of the farmer. So, physiocrats said, what is this all about trading, business? In fact, the physiocrats called the merchants and traders as the sterile class, because they were unproductive in their eyes. So, they said les classes terrils, this les classes terrils is this the one which is going to be leading to the wealth of nations, no. So, straight away the physiocrats dismissed mercantilist argument, as I said this is hitting them in the foundations, it is a lot better than using quantity theory and telling them it is like this like that, no, straight away telling them who are these traders, are you swearing by them, where is the theory behind you saying traders are the source of surplus. Traders make profit by converting one purchase into a purchase a profitable sale into another hands, but that is sterile activity according to the physiocrats. So, they said the merchants, businessmen are like class steril, there is no question of their leading to prosperity of the nation straight away. So, this was the physiocratic critique. Do you have some question on the physiocrats at this point in time? Yes. This is beautiful. My God. Say that again. Was this argument that has been incorporated by Marx in this critique? Definitely. Which argument? The, we are the source of surplus, surplus value. Absolutely. Absolutely. Can you say that again? Because you have made a very strong point. I would like you to. Uh, carry the day if you can. The surplus, the creation of surplus uh -huh. by the, the farming. Not so much by the farm laborer, but uh, the criticism that trading and uh, merchant capital is not the source of surplus. That is what Marx said, right? You are right. So, Marx was very critical of this saying at a particular point in the development of capitalism, 
merchant class was significant when the commercial revolution was going on through Europe. But this was just a this was just something which preceded industrial and agricultural revolution which were the major revolutions in Europe. So, you cannot say that the merchant in Europe brought prosperity to Europe. It was the manufacturer who brought prosperity. It is the it is the intelligent farmer who brought prosperity true. More importantly Marx was not so much concerned about prosperity, but he said where does the surplus output come from in the system. So, Marx said no where did it come from the traders. Would you like me to expand on that point a little bit. You see in the development of capitalism where the initial stock of capital for starting industries comes from that is the question. Once the capitalist industrial base comes into existence then it is ok it is kind of self reproduces and grows. Where does the first stock of investment come from? Marx called this primitive accumulation. You are familiar with this term? Where did you study Marx before this? Chala Rajan. Okay. You see, I, and you read Marx in the original too? Yeah. Fantastic. You are blessed. I have not read much. At least at your age, I had not read Marx in the original. That is fantastic. So, okay. So, what is primitive accumulation? Who can tell me? The initial stock of capital for investment through which capitalism grows. So, there were two sources of growth of this primitive accumulation according to Marx. A large part of it came from traders who traded with the colonies and who traded with the African and Asian countries who later became colonies and brought in huge quantities of surplus from trade for investment. So, part of the investment in English industrialization for instance came from English trading profits. So, a lot of later day joint stock companies and their shareholders were big time traders one. Second the English agriculture itself had gone through a revolution. There were farmers in England by the middle of uh, 18th century who were known as gentlemen farmers. Have you heard of this? Do you know where the word gentleman came from? Take a shot. We use it all the time, no? Probably we do not use it much, but 30 years ago people were, were fond of talking about ladies and gentlemen. No? Okay, we will leave aside gentlemen now. You see, when feudalism declined, the power of the feudal lords in rural England was slowly taken over by the middle class farmer who was a big experimenter, who was a big pioneer of new seeds, new varieties, new technologies etcetera. Most of these gentlemen were but tenants, they held land as tenants of the aristocracy, but they were the ones who were really the dynamos of British agriculture. They did a lot of things including the enclosure movement about which talked day before yesterday did I enclosure yes I did yeah so. Now, these gentlemen farmers they were called gentlemen farmers because they were very prosperous and they were the ones who were really making profits in agriculture. They were the ones who were earning money from agriculture the aristocrats were intent on spending that money as fast as possible. So, the gentleman farmer who had that money who wanted to do something with this money. According to Marx, the profits from agriculture from the English agrarian revolution in the hands of the gentleman farmers was the second source of primitive accumulation. Hmm? So, that is where the primitive accumulation came from and therefore, Marx had the strong criticism saying okay, it, it provided the primitive accumulation for English industrialization and the development of British capitalism, but capitalism itself it was not the merchant capital which was important, but it was the manufacturing capital 
which became important which was the reason why England became a powerhouse of the world was not because of the merchant who did their bit, but because of the manufacturer in England. Okay, so, that takes care of Marx. So, you have any other question? I like that interjection about Marx, because it was good, it was timely. Okay, so, trading was not productive according to physiocrats, it is farming which is productive. Then came the critique from John Locke. John Locke himself a very strong mercantilist sympathizer basically, but John Locke was known even better as a libertarian. Who is a libertarian? Libertarian is a nice word, but libertine is not a good word to describe somebody else. Okay, so, tell me some, something about John Locke, also a great thinker, no? Oh, tell me. So, uh, okay, I think the difference lies in uh, conception of freedom itself as mm. negative liberty or positive liberty. Mm. So, uh, for the libertarians, uh, law and state is, is, is a form of like a negative liberty in the sense that they uh, create the rules within which you are supposed to function. Mm -hmm. And for them, uh, uh, yes, you are on the track. Yeah. Uh, so, what they, uh, I, I, I can't. Uh, no, you are doing fine. Yes. Uh, it's basically, John Locke talked about sovereignty in his treatises and mm. for mm. the government. Uh, he, he placed sovereignty within the community. Mm. And this community was, was independent from the state. Like, Whatever the community thought was good for the overall thing. It's for state. the dormant and the active sovereignty. Yeah, but, but overall, the, with the community, it's the dormant sovereignty. Sovereignty. Mm, the, the dominant sovereignty. No, so, I mean he believed that the dominant sovereignty lay with the people, and the active sovereignty lay with the state. Mm. Active sovereignty in the sense, uh, in terms of rule making, mm. and basically rule making in the sense that rules which do not uh, in any way uh, uh, impinge. impinge upon the three natural laws of uh, property, life and liberty. Mm -hmm. And in case the state is not able to carry out this duty, the uh, the uh, sovereignty of the people can come into force, come into play and they can actually like oh, in today's oh. sense vote the government out or in back then they can actually like tell, uh, cha ask for a change in the sovereign, the authority itself. Have a revolution. Yeah. Right. Beautiful, lovely. Now, I am bringing in Locke into the scenario in a slightly less important way. Locke was talking about landed property and Locke's argument for landed property was something like labor theory of value. It, the whole idea of property evolves from Locke's idea of the natural liberty of a man uh, which enables him to do whatever he wants with his labor. So, he says property is, a, is an outcome of such labor from a person, exercise of the right to use his labor whichever way he wants and in so exercising he acquires property. So, Locke is fine as far as property goes, but then he asks the question how do inequalities come about in society. And then he says inequalities come about because not of landed property which comes through use of uh, the right to dispose of one's labor, but it comes because of money. He says people get money, it does two things, one it makes them greedy to get more money and secondly it gives them an avenue to accumulate. 
So, it is the accumulation of money, a part of which results itself into land, more landed property, which is the source of inequality. So, according to Locke, the mercantilist phenomenon of rapidly growing income through trade might well end up simply producing more inequality in a society, which is basically violative of the society's character. So, Locke's criticism comes in a very oblique and a very indirect fashion. Locke does not deny that trading produces profits. Locke does not deny that these profits are useful, but he says what it leads to is eventually possibly considerable amount of inequality in society and inequality by itself comes in the way of the exercise of liberty. Unequal people cannot be equally enjoying liberty, that is the argument. Then came another major argument of home, which was much more significant than the quantity theory or the special flow mechanism. This is Holmes argument that trading between countries does not have to be predatory. You see after all the world view which a mercantilist had was a very predatory world view. What is, what is predation? there is a prey and a predator like as in mm -hmm. a weaker and a stronger power and a stronger power overcome. Right. See the mercantilist worldview is that the nation must be strong, so that it becomes the strongest nation. In order to do this it must indulge in predatory activities, basically consuming gold and bullion from some other country through trade surplus right and you use sometimes the power of your economy, power of your armed forces to ensure that the other one does not respond to your tariffs as in how you impose them. In other words, from your tariff leading to his counter tariff, his counter tariff leading to your counter counter tariff, it is a tariff war. So, what prevents tariff war from occurring in a mercantilist world? It prevents it from occurring. What prevents it from occurring is the military might of one of the nations. One of the nations is just too strong for the other one to respond. In other words, therefore, the picture that the mercantilists painted of the world around is a predatory world and they justified it by saying the strong nations will rule, they have to rule because they are strong and the job is to make your nation strong through whatever means. Now, Holmes says this is a very negative view of the world. Holmes says there is enough space in the world around where everybody can trade to their profit and grow. There is no reason why predation should be the policy for the growth of any nation. So, the assumption that the world is finite and limited, benefits to be attained from this world are finite and limited is questioned by home. He says the, the benefits from trade are immense and many and therefore, every nation can participate in free trade and grow. There is no reason why you should have these restrictive trade practices by anybody should grow. So, Holmes argument was that there is enough space in the world for everybody to grow through free trade. There is no need to have a predatory policy. Hmm? So, Holmes, Holmes idea closely followed or simultaneously, fo yes you have a question, simultaneously followed by Smith's theory of free trade. Smith says whoever has an advantage in having more productive labor in a particular industry will have a comparative will have an absolute advantage in the manufacture and export of that commodity. So, it is the whole thing is based on efficiency, the whole thing is based on quality of labor, the whole thing is based on therefore, how you can have processes which continuously enhance labor quality and he says this is possible only through division of labor. Division of labor is nothing but dividing a production process into many sub processes, so that each builds more specialization, each builds more skill, so that the overall productivity in the manufacturing industry will grow. So, Smith says this is, this is the secret of it all. Division of labor creates productivity, skill and therefore, 
superior output it has nothing to do with trading it has nothing to do with trading profits so smith's argument about the free trade and and the gains to be made by all nations of the world in free trade supported holmes argument that the world is a much bigger place than mercantilist gave scope for and gave rise to a completely different idea of trade in the world growth of commerce growth of business across the world the whole thing changed with the with the ideas of home and smith in a matter of 30 40 years the world became a place where free trade was celebrated and any kind of restriction in trade was viewed upon as a retrograde step so more than anything else the theoretical proof which smith gave to the gains from free trade and the logic of the arguments which home made that the world is a much bigger place permitting a lot of free competition and growth for everybody both these arguments really put paid to a lot of mercantilism now free trade by the 1950s free trade is a maxim of a whole group of economists from the us who believe free trade alone is good for the world market any restriction on trade is one which leads to growing power of the state and this power of the state is something bad as communism is and so since the 1950s economic research economic ideas and economic classroom teaching continuously emphasizes the advantages of free trade and all uh, universities were teaching theories of trade which were only different ways in which theoretical justification for free trade was given by 1960s people started finding other interesting things which were happening they found that not only across international trade but within the country also capitalism was misunderstood by most people capitalism had been understood by people to think of a world where there were entrepreneurs who were maximizing profits and therefore uh, following all those nice calculus in microeconomics and then eventually getting to maximize profits and therefore maximize the welfare of the whole society it was found by 1960 actually the early literature started coming there was a man called george bain professor in harvard who started looking at american business trying to find out what is american business really doing what's the corporate world really doing and he wrote a lovely book called entry barriers in the us economy he found most businesses across europe across us were not trying to maximize profit what were they trying to do they were trying to make sure that others did not enter the business patent intellectual property is a classic case of entry barriers you acquire an intellectual property precisely because others cannot produce this commodity all science and technology research is of this type then you deliberately create a scale of investment a size of physical capital outlay which will be prohibitive for most people they can't invest that money petrochemical industries for instance whether petrochemical industries do depend upon this big highly expensive technology or whether there are smaller technologies available is a difficult thing to say but certainly petrochemical industry in the middle uh, of 19th century was not this capital intensive as it was in the middle of the 20th century so the argument was that you deliberately create technologies which involve very high sunk cost sunk cost in other words very heavy capital outlay fixed capital so that nobody else can take that risk and sink so much money and get into the business there were many other reasons why george bain found that american business 
was mainly trying to prevent entry into different industries, creating barriers to entry rather than making more profits. Now, this was extended to international trade. There were economists who said, well, this is what is happening across the world. Different countries are trying to prevent competition from other countries in the areas where they are specializing. They do not want other countries to become competitors to them in the world market. So, it was suddenly seen that existing theories of free trade were great if you accept that free trade existed, but otherwise as explanations of why trade occurred, there were better explanations including the explanation of entry barriers. The reason I am saying all this is once you accept, accept entry barriers as a possible strategy in the global market, you are back to mercantilism with vengeance, are not you? So, the argument of third world countries today is that while the arguments by the developed part of the world in the international economic fora are for liberalization of trade or for non-interference by government in trade, removal of tax barriers, tariff barriers. All these things in the World Economic Forum are said to be good healthy policies and under economic reform, the government itself minimizes its hand in the economy, lets the economy go free. On the one hand, this is the argument. On the other hand, the world is becoming more and more and more predatory in actual fact. Technology, intellectual property are very predatory agents. So, at this point in time, I can only say that while at the time of Home and Adam Smith, the mercantilists looked rather ridiculous against the power of the argument of Smithian economics. A couple of hundred years down the line, the mercantilists are not looking all that foolish is what it appears. It seems that the world definitely has a streak of predatoriness about it, just as it has an element of competitiveness too. The world is not a 100 percent competitive place, the world is also not a 100 percent predatory place, it is all there. Sometimes this dominates, sometimes that dominates. So, in the final analysis, what do we say about Smithian and Holmes argument about the possibility of predatoriness. We can only say that there are different historical epochs in the world economy where predatoriness seemed to dominate. There were other epochs where freedom of trade, competitiveness seemed to have dominated. Certainly from around the second or third decade of 19th century till the first world war the world economy was definitely a lot freer place. There was a lot of open market competition, this sort of thing happened. But the argument is that it happened only because England had already become very powerful, it could afford to compete. The argument is made that India by 1780, 81 was the largest exporter in the world. Indian textiles was the largest textile industry in the world. It was a direct competition to Manchester as Manchester textile industry was growing in British industrialization. It was totally mercantilist protectionist policies of the British government, which converted India according to Indian economic historians from 1780 when India was the largest exporter of textiles to 1830 when India was net importer of textiles. This is a process which Indian economic historians describe as a process of deindustrialization of India and it was done according to them as a matter of deliberate policy. So, that Indian textile is no longer a competition to Manchester which was refusing to grow in the face of Indian competition. Indian calicos with all the duties paid, with all the insurance paid, with all the shipping costs were still cheaper in London than Manchester textiles which was which were made in Lancashire. This was because of the quality and technological advantage which Indian handicrafts had at that time which could be priced that low. So, it is argued that British could become patrons of free trade 
after they had enjoyed the benefits of protection. So, in the long run looking at mercantilists in a historical perspective, we can only say that specific policies seem to be justified at specific times when specific class interests are served. When the merchants and businessmen were dominant in Europe and they had the help of the monarch, mercantilism became very popular. Just as you have the enormous corporate power today in modern world, where corporate power sways the decision making power of governments. So, that policy is very much pro corporate. It is not the 1990s and onwards that I am talking about. Even in the 1960s for instance in India, the licensing policy, they say the government encouraged the license Raj in those days, but the license Raj existed because it suited the Indian corporates. The big four or five companies in India would always grab the licenses first, so that others did not grab the license. Well, entry barrier no and due through the 60s a number of these licenses would be grabbed by these corporates simply not to use it, and but to make sure that others did not use it. So, this was an epoch where India was a planned economy with some kind of socialist objective of minimizing inequality in the economy through a whole lot of processes, but that planned economy served the interests of the corporates in India. So, we go back. It is not a question of which is in principle better, whether predation is better or free trade is better. The question is there are epochs in human history, where sometimes predation appears to take hold, sometimes free trade tends to, seems to take hold, but there is really nothing permanent about either of these is the conclusion that emerges today. Now, Quite aside from all this that we have talk, talked about mercantilism, there is yet another new chapter which unfolded in the 1930s, when after nearly 200 years academia in economics started looking at mercantilists with considerably more favor. This was because the economics of Smith and Ricardo, which dominated economics subsequently and then their own offshoots in the writings of Jevons and Marshall and Walra and so on and so forth. Money became totally discounted as a powerful thing in economics. From the time of Smith it was fashionable to argue it is the real sector of the economy which matters. How much is somebody producing, how much is somebody manufacturing and how are they trading. In other words the supply of goods and services becomes central to the argument of economists. What about money? Well, money is fine, but money cannot make you grow was Smith's argument as a critique of mercantilists, but it was a major part of Smith's argument and then it was taken up by all his disciples later and modern economists too, the neoclassical economists. So, right up to the time of the 1930s up to the time of Keynes, it had become fashionable to argue that money is really nothing. Fundamentally money is neutral. In other words, you inject money into the system, it cannot help you produce more goods and services. Money might simply produce an increase in prices and might increase the nominal value of goods, but it does not change the rate, real rate at which goods exchange amongst each other. In other words, a system of relative prices, commodity prices in relative terms rather than nominal prices became the desideratum up to the time of Keynes. So, Keynes came and found a world, he found that a great depression was happening. What is a depression? I thought you would say we go into the blues, <laughs> Okay, yeah fine. So, Slowing down of the economy. Right. Unemployment also. Right. So the economy goes on a downward vortex. Less demand, less.
production, less employment, less demand again, less production, spiral. No? And Keynes was asking, what do you do about the spiral? How do you get out of the spiral? So, Keynes says, you have to generate demand. And how do you generate demand? Pump money into the economy, exactly mercantilism, right. So, Keynes said, let the government bring 100 crores of rupees and pay everybody to dig a hole on the road. Give them 10 rupees every time he dug a hole. Next day, give him 10 rupees to fill it up. It is called public works, right. That is what they are doing in Chennai all the time. They are digging holes, not filling them up very equally, efficiently. Monsoons are coming. So, a lot of people are going to fall into holes and vanish full of water. So, anyway, so Skane says public works. How do you find money for public works? Very simple. The government has a surplus budget hmm? or a deficit budget, what would it have? The government would spend more than it earns, no, it is a deficit. So, the government simply spends more and where does it come from? From the budget, from the money bags of the government. So, the, the, simply, the government simply pumps money into the economy and the money is used to dig holes and fill them up. And what happens? That these fellows who have dug holes and filled them up, they go to the shop that evening and spend the money. I want rice, I want kerosene, I want cooking oil, I want vegetables, I want tamarind and so on and so forth. So, the next day there is not only a demand for this stock of tamarind and this that, the money which is spent in the shops goes back to the workers who will come into employment. So, those guys say, now I have got my job back in my uh, rice mill, I have got my job back in the tamarind crushing factory, I have got my job back in the cloth making textile industry. So, they come to the market and say, I want more rice, I want more vegetables, I want more oil. In other words, there are several successive rounds of spending that starts from the first round of spending. And what does Keynes call it? Absolutely. And the multipli multiplier is totally monetarily created, right. So, Keynes said, what is wrong with money? What is wrong with money? I mean, good. You spend money, it will trigger demand and that is what the mercantilist said, is not it? All the money is needed, why? Because it will trigger demand. When it triggers demand, the economy will grow, production will grow, prosperity will come. So, Keynes was being mercantilist with a vengeance. Not only that, when Keynes was writing about mercantilist, it was the first time somebody was being sympathetic to the mercantilist after nearly 200 years of mercantilist being thought of as just bad stupid boys. Hmm? So, this is something too which has to be kept in mind. So, did we say, do we then say that Keynes proved indirectly that there was more to mercantilists were simply than simply business of bullionism. Because the fundamental argument of mercantilists pretty, is pretty much like Keynes. They did not talk about multiplier, but it is very clear they had something like that in mind. You have 1 million dollars worth of gold flowing in that creates waves of spending, why not? So, the big question about mercantilists is today whether they were all that foolish or whether the critics of mercantilism were all that smart. Certainly, we know that there has been a considerable revival of interest in mercantilist policies, particularly after Keynes showed theoretically that spending money to revive demand and an economy is as good as doing something else physically you know. So, this distinction between monetary and real factors in the economy which the classical and neoclassical economists had been 
emphasizing from the time of Adam Smith, Smith um, Keynes showed that this, this distinction is really not a valid distinction at all. Secondly, as opposed to the classical assumption that money was just neutral, it did really nothing. Keynes showed that money was a very powerful agent and monetary policy is a major agent of transforming an economy, is a major agent of generating employment even till pushing the economy to a full employment stage. So, looking back in time, in retrospect, what does one say about the mercantilists? We can only say that the critique against mercantilists at the time when it happened did make them look foolish. But then this was only in an epoch when everybody was talking of free trade. But in another epoch when everybody stopped talking about free trade, mercantilists do not look all that foolish. So, once again we come back to the question, a particular economic policy takes on roots and becomes appealing depending upon what context it is in, what historical context it is in. So, there was a historical context in which the mercantilist became immensely popular. There was a historical context in which free trade became immensely popular and mercantilists started looking so stupid. And there is another historical context a couple of hundred years down the line now when people are much wiser, they realize that the distinctions which Adam Smith made between real and monetary, the distinctions which uh, uh, Adam Smith and his disciples made between uh, real factors of the economy and the neutrality of money, all these distinctions have to be re-examined in different contexts. That is the lesson we have learned. Have a lovely weekend. <laughs>